yeah, 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 right. So we have to And then, but to record, what you hear record once. And that jump like this. And then one of us. Otherwise, if they are done, okay, so what they can put the green on the other side. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Hi. Oh, hi. Melanie. Oh, yeah, right. I recognize this. So, yeah, I think now officially. Yeah. Not following the science footsteps of my dad. Yes. Wow. Still working on that. Cool. Guys, we have a system here. Let's say you have a problem, you know, you need help. Oh, okay. Let's say you have a problem. You take one of the red notes, we'll give you, you stick it to your laptop like this. That means I have a problem, I need help, and somebody will come around. And if you're already done with your task and you're ready to go one more, you can put your green flag up here. So that helps us a little bit, especially people who are struggling, you know. We, we don't want you to struggle, so I suggest, first of all, try to pair up with your neighbor. Hopefully your neighbor has a solution, you know. But if that doesn't work, you know, put the red flag up or, you know, let us know so we can help you. So who is still installing software? Can I see? Okay, we'll, we'll wait a couple more minutes. So you may want to download your slides. So when I present, you know, I'll start here with introduction and open up the presentation. If you want to have your local copy of it, you can click this download button here. Because if you don't, you will see those links. They don't work in GitHub. So if you really want to use it, you click download here. And now all the links in here you know, will work. I guess we'll, we'll get started. My name is uh, Peter Rose. I'm from the San Diego Supercomputer Center at UCSD. And with me, I have two colleagues. We have, um, let's see, we have Fergus Imry and we have Fergus Boyles over here. So the three of us will, will lead this workshop. Initially, we also had Tim Head here. He couldn't, unfortunately, couldn't make it today here. So the three of us uh, will do the tutorial here today. Um, okay. So let's get started. So we'll talk a little bit about reproducibility. So I mean, as you, as you know, there's some reproducibility crisis, and it's easy to understand if you work in a lab, you know, it can be sometimes hard to reproduce things. But you think if you're working on a computer, it should be 100% reproducible. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So we hope today give you some tools in how you can really create an environment that, that's reproducible. So if you publish a paper, hopefully the methods will be reproducible. And more importantly, other people can actually run your tools too and don't run into problems. So I don't will go much into in our reproducibility crisis, but what do we really mean by reproducibility? So it really means to get you know, consistent results using the same data, using the same computational methods, and using the same conditions. You know, basically that, that would be reproducibility. On the other hand, there's something called replicability, Replicability is a little different. This is where you do an independent study and come basically to the same conclusions, but you don't follow it step by step. That's more an independent kind of you know, reproducibility. And today we'll also talk about reusability because it doesn't help much if, you, if we can reproduce your research, 
but nobody else can really use it for their own problems. You know, let's say you want to take a computational protocol from one study and apply it to your own data. That's what I would call re reusability, and that means obtaining new results using basically the same computational methods and, and so forth. So what we're focusing in today is in this gray box. So we focus on reproducibility as well as reusability. Okay, so this shows kind of four pillars of reproducible research. First of all, I mean, we already do this, the open access publication, but really to have a reproducible environment, you need all the data need to be open, all your code needs to be open, and that's kind of obvious. People are already doing that. They put their code into GitHub, they put you know, data in repositories, but one thing that's missing is a reproducible environment that's shown here in red. And this is what we want to work on today a little bit by putting basically our software onto Binder, and therefore it's accessible to everyone. Okay, I mean, there are many problems with reproducibility. Those are just two things I copied from the internet. For example, you have different versions of the operating system, different versions. Maybe people ran the software with different parameters but didn't tell you about it and, and so forth. Or the programs are in different programming languages different file formats, you have problems with readability, maybe the software isn't documented well, you can't really understand what it means and so on. And what happens is, I'm sure you had this experience that's shown you on the right hand side, you're trying to install some software, you run into all kinds of issues. Usually when you make a new study, basically the reviewer will ask you, you know, how does this compare to method X from somebody else? And you try to install the software and you, know, you run into all kinds of problems. Have, have you had any of those problems, anyone? So hopefully today we'll try help a little bit with, with this, you know, so you don't see things like in this box over here. Okay, so this is what we're going to learn today. Basically, we'll help your tools to overcome those barriers and publish reproducible workflows and results. What do I mean by that? Let's say you publish a paper. Ideally, every figure in your paper should be automatically generated and reproducible. Every table with data and so on should be reproducible. And that's where we hope to get to today. Okay, so this is what we're going to cover today. We already had you kind of install some software, but later on, Fergus will go over you know, about the Conda environment, why we chose that, how do you define your software dependencies. You know, if you don't have the right version of software, things may not be reproducible. Then we talk a little bit about Jupyter Notebooks, and we show some examples. One will be a machine learning example, the other one will be biological visualization. And then we show you how to open source your code and how you collaborate on, on GitHub. And then finally, we talk about making your source code reproducible by having it run on, on mybinder.org. And uh, then finally, in the last hour, we'll basically we'll do your own project. You can either use one of our examples, or if you have some Jupyter notebook, we'll show you how to make that reproducible by anyone. So any, I can take your notebook and run it, and I don't need to install any software or anything like that. So that's the rough idea of what we're going to do today. Okay, so what you learn today is, is a number of tools. So there are five tools you will learn about today. So first we have Jupyter Notebook. Then we have Binder. That's an environment to basically share your software openly. Then we have Conda. That basically is used to install third-party software packages and, and also to manage your environment. Remember when we talked about the four pillars of open research. One is to define your environment, and this is where Conda helps with then obviously you need to version your software. You know, every version may produce different results. So we talk about Git. And then finally, you need to host your software, and it's being hosted on, on GitHub. So those are the five components we will go over it. So I just want to figure out you know, where you guys are. So who, who has used Jupyter Notebook and kind of knows how to get around Jupyter? Let's see, so maybe about one third or so. Okay, that's good. Yeah, right session, yeah. <laughs> How about Binder? Anybody has used Binder? Okay, not, not too many. Okay, great. How about GitHub? Git and GitHub. Okay, so it looks like maybe two-thirds have used Git or GitHub. And how about Conda? Anybody has used Conda? Okay, maybe also maybe two-thirds. Okay. I think you're just at the right level for 
this course then. Okay. So I'll just go quickly over those components, not in much detail. So the two Ferguses here, they will go into much detail here, you know. So what what is Conda? It's it's a package management system. Maybe you have used things like pandas or numpy or matplotlib, things like that. Basically, it helps you install and update those kind of packages. But the good thing about Conda is you have an isolated environment. Maybe you you need Conda versions, you need, let's say, a NumPy version X and NumPy version Y. You can have them both installed at the same time. They won't interfere with each other. That's one of the advantages of, of um, Conda. Um, and you can create multiple environments on your laptop, and you know, they won't interfere with it. Plus, it works on all platforms, and basically all languages are supported. So we will be using that, basically, to define this red column here called environment. Okay, Jupyter Notebook, I probably hope most of you have seen the Jupyter Notebook. The idea of a Jupyter Notebook is that you can combine code, visualization, text, all in, in one document, which is nicely shown here. You see some equations in here, some text. You see you can interact with it. You can have visualization all in one place. So this is a perfect environment you know, for, for many computational analysis because in most cases you will have some kind of plot or some figure coming out and you can create it all in Jupyter Notebook. Um, just to give you an idea, there are about 4.8 million Jupyter Notebooks in GitHub currently. It's growing phenomenally, probably more than a million notebooks a year or more. It's, it's like an exponential growth really taking off. Now, do, today we will actually use one thing called Jupyter Lab, which is kind of the next generation Jupyter Notebook as well. Okay, then we talk about GitHub. So Git is a software, basically it's a version control software, and you can track changes to your code. You can also roll back a change. Let's say you made a change and all of a sudden everything is broken. There's a way to go back to the previous version. And one important thing too is if you're working on a team, you can share your code with others. You can co-develop you know, code. And then finally, the code needs to live somewhere on the cloud, and that's where GitHub comes in. It's a hosting platform for your software. And for example, you can take somebody else's code and fork it, make it basically making a duplicate of it. You can make changes to it. So for example, let's say you want to take this workshop that we created for today, and you want to present it to your own research group. You could fork it, maybe make some modifications to it, and have your own version for it. And if you think it's a great, you made some great additions to it, you could then make a pull request and send it to us, and then we say, okay, yeah, we, we like what you added, and let's, let's add it to our repository. So that's the idea of sharing code. Okay, so finally there's Binder. Binder is basically an open, free environment to share reproducible research. So, you know, you can run your notebooks on your own computer, but you want other people to run your notebook too, and you can do that with zero software installation using Binder, and we'll show you how. Okay. So I'm going to talk now a little bit high level about how you basically design a, a, a Jupyter notebook so it's really reusable. And we came out, who is familiar with the 10 simple rules series from computational biology? We've seen those before. There's a whole series of them. We recently wrote one, and that's about uh, you know, share, share, um, writing and sharing computational analysis. And basically, when you design a notebook, you need to think about you know, how to organize information. A notebook is more like a book that has chapters, so you want to have some overall organization to it. But then you also have code in there, so you need to think about what to do about code. And finally, the basic idea is we want people to reuse your code, so we need to think about how do you share and how to explain your methods. So I'm not going to go into too much steps. This article is supposed to come out on July, uh, no, when is it? I think July 25th, so I think sometime later this week you can actually see the paper. There's a preprint here too. But just briefly, you can read it yourself, but I briefly just go over a few important steps here. So this shows how different tools map onto this cycle. So in the middle, we have the Jupyter Notebook, obviously, that does everything. Then we have Conda, basically, that is used to set up your environment and version control. Then we have GitHub, where you version your software. And then we have Binder, to share it with everyone. 
Okay, so let's quickly go over those rules, and I don't going to go into much detail since you can read that by your, on your own. You know, but the idea of a Jupyter notebook is not just a bunch of code. If you go to GitHub, you will see a lot of notebooks. There's some cryptic code. They have no idea what it's for, what they're doing, what the results mean. You really need to think about, you know, telling a story. That's that's the power of a of a notebook here. You know, you have a beginning, you introduce your topic, you describe the steps, and at the end also interpret the results. Many notebooks, they show you a plot at the end, but there's no description what it means, why you did it. Okay, and then the idea is to document the process. You know, you go through multiple computational steps. You should really explain them. That might be clear to you, but probably not to anybody else. And then a notebook, if you haven't seen it before, it has sections in it, like a book. And you really want to make each step clear. You don't want to have a very long cell in there. So you want to have each cell in a notebook do one meaningful step. That means maybe do a calculation, make a figure, something like that. So it should be you know, organized that way. And if you have a very large workflow, and we'll show you some of those, you can create multiple notebooks. You have notebook one, two, three. You have a logical um, workflow like you have chapters in a book. Okay, you also want to modularize their code. Let's say you use the same method over and over again. You want to break it out, for example, as a Python method so you can reuse it in multiple points. You don't want to copy and paste code into different cells. And now rule five, this is where the environment comes in. We need to explicitly uh, show all the um, dependencies, you know, okay, my code depends on NumPy version 18 point something and so on. So, you know, you need to really record all of that and that can be done through the conda environment.yml file, which you have already seen in your software installation. And then obviously we need to use version control because every time you make a change to your software, the results will change. And then really Later on, you should really think about making your notebook a pipeline where other people can plug in new data and, and run it. You know, don't think it as a one-time thing that you throw away. Think it about as a reusable uh, workflow. Okay, now we're coming to sharing. You know, so to have really a reproducible environment, first of all, all your data need to be you know, identified, and they need to be stable too. You cannot work on a data set that changes from week to week. So you need to have a stable data set that has a persistent identifier such as a DOI or an ARC, and that could be in a biological repository like NCBI, or Ensemble, PDB, you know, some data sets that have a fixed version. Or if it's not available, if it's really your own data, you may consider putting that into a general repository like Xenodo and similar things. Now if you have small data sets, for example, our tutorial has some data sets, they're small and self-contained, so we put them directly into GitHub. So that's a possibility too. With the exception, your files need to be less than 50 megabytes. That's the limit for, for GitHub. Generally, you want to separate your data from your code. For example, you want to create a data directory where you keep your data. You don't want to mix it in you know, with your code. That's not a good idea. But sometimes, you know, you really work in large data sets. You have a terabyte data set that, you know, that's difficult to share. In those cases, you may consider, you know, you, you do publish your notebooks with a sample data set that's small enough to show kind of the results, but it may not, you know, represent everything. And if you have a multi-step process, you also want to save the intermediate steps, for example, in an intermediate data folder, and that also helps with reproducibility. You can follow somebody's notebook step by step and see they, at every step do I get the same results, you know, as, as they say. Okay, so and then another thing is to really make your notebook ready for sharing and be explored. There are a few things you need to add. Obviously, you need to have a description like a readme file. You also need a license file. Any Git repository that doesn't have a license is essentially not useful. Everything needs a license these days. You know, otherwise you are not Sure, if you can actually reuse your code, maybe there are some legal issue involved with it. So we always recommend you know, to use what is called a liberal software license like MIT, Apache 2, or BSD license for that. And GitHub will actually help you to create those license files. So never put out things without a license because it's difficult to reuse it if you don't have a license. 
And also, while we think you know, Jupyter notebooks are still going to run five years or 10 years from now, I'm not sure that in 20 years, if you take any of the notebooks, they probably don't run anymore. You know? So if you really want to have a permanent record of your research, you probably want to do still, in addition, create a PDF file so you have more like maybe 20 years from now, still somebody can look at your notebook. You know? may not be able to run it anymore. That's just life. You know, things won't live forever. You know. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and then we want to also be able to share our Jupyter notebooks, and that's where Binder comes in. We can create links. You can send a link to somebody, to your colleague, and they can run your notebook. Or you can create little badges, and we'll show you. You can put them on your web page, or you can put it in, in a Git repository. Anybody can just click on that link and run any of your notebooks without software installation. Okay, so I also want you to be an advocate for open source research. The reason why uh, Fergus, Fergus, and myself do this session here, we really believe in reproducible research. So we hope you become, after the session, become an advocate. So maybe in your lab, you show them what you learned here and share your notebooks with your colleagues or your boss and so on. You know, really try to put this in, into practice. And, and here, this is how you can measure if, if you're really working effectively. That's the second point. When next time you create a paper, do all your figures, do them automatically. Don't go into R or whatever software or Excel or whatever software package you're using to make your plots. You can create them automatically in a Jupyter notebook. Anytime your data changed, you just run the notebook again and there it is. As an example, one of my postdocs, she made a figure for a paper we submitted and the reviewer wanted to have some changes to it. So then she spends three days to recreate the new figure in R rather than just having it in a Jupyter notebook and you put in the new data and hit run and you're done in a minute. You know? So this is the way of thinking of in terms of reproducible research. So all your figures, data, uh, tables, they can all be nicely created in a Jupyter notebook. And Brad Wojtek, he's one of my colleagues at UCSD, he had this Twitter message. Basically he publishes you know, his traditional paper, but in addition, he has always a you know, GitHub account with Jupyter Notebooks where he can reproduce every step of all his papers. Okay, so that's, that's the end of my presentation. So maybe I'll show you just how you launch things on, on Binder with this. The thing about Binder is it's free. And as you know, everything that's free, you get what you pay for. So that means, let's try to run binder here, it's, it's slow. It may take a few minutes to come up. So if you go to this Git repository, and you don't necessarily need to do that now. So this is a Git repository that comes with this 10 simple rules paper. And there are links in here. This says launch Jupyter Notebook or launch Jupyter Lab. So let's just try that and see what happens. So this is what happens. You see the spinning wheel here. Unfortunately, that sometimes spins for several minutes here, so that's the only downside of all of this. And if you want to know what's going on here, you go to build logs, and it says oh, it's launching the server, so it's going to take, take some time here. Okay. So in the meantime, are there any questions? Okay, no questions, good. All right, let's see if this comes up. Oh, I think that it's coming up now. So this is Jupyter Lab now. You put, who has seen Jupyter Lab before? Okay, not, not, not that many. It looks like a Jupyter notebook. So here, you know, on the right-hand side, this is how it typically looks. What's different in Jupyter Lab is that we have a left-hand menu. And then let's, let me just quickly walk through this. Uh, this particular, this is a use case, you know, an example how to share code reproducible. So this is a machine learning example. First of all, we need some input data. See the data in a data direct. We keep them separate from the code. So there are a few data files in here. Um, let's see, here on the left-hand side, those are the data files. And there's, yeah, okay. Let's see. And then we have a workflow here. You see, instead of having one huge long notebook, I put it into, into steps, you know. First of all, the first one called zero-workflow, this is, gives an overview and has links to every notebook. Yes, please. Oh, oh yeah, right, okay, let me see. How about this? Can everybody see that? 
Good point, thanks. Um, so you now to do a machine learning example, first you need to have some data set. You need to prepare your data. So this is in create data set. I mean, then we calculate some features for it. Finally, we fit a model, and then we make the prediction. You see how, how the logical steps, how, how we broke that out. And so this notebook is more like a tutorial, but you see here's an introduction that t tells a little bit about the problem we're trying to solve and then create a data set. So this notebook is like a top-level notebook, like a table of contents. So you can link to other notebooks, for example, this one here, create data set. So we can go in here. So this is the first one that creates a data set. And this is a Jupyter notebook, and we get more into detail. I don't want to explain too much, but let me just run this one so I can say run all cells. It will run through the whole notebook here. And you know, it's currently actually doing some calculations here. We'll see the results soon. See, here's an example. Here you can create tables right here in, in the notebook. You know, you don't need to create them in any other form. So here you see some uh, protein sequences. So this is just an example of a Jupyter notebook that prepares the data set. And then, then we go to the next step here, which is now we're going to calculate some features here. And again, you know, you run through the steps here, and in the end it will create some figures and, and results and, and, and so forth. So this is like a typical workflow. So we hope when you, when you work on a problem, try to break it into steps, you know, make it as easy to understand as Paul, well, because the research you do, you don't do it for yourself, you do it for other people so they can reuse it. You know? So please have a look at this 10 simple rules paper and, and this uh, example, you know, maybe you can emulate that in, in your own research. And I think that's the end of it. And by the way, this is all, you know, you don't need to install any software, the only thing I had to do, click on that link and you see you can run the notebooks here. So that's the idea of using Binder and sharing your notebook publicly. So any other questions then before we go on? Okay, I guess we'll get started. Do I, do I want to set it as headphones or microphone? Do I want to tell my computer that that is headphones or microphone? Yes, it's a microphone. That's right. I'm getting, I'm getting a bit here. Is that okay? It's okay. So it's not on the. Can you just cut it to mirrors? Yeah, yeah, sure. Cool, thanks. So, sorry about that little, um, I guess, 
tech setup. Um, so I guess the title of this, uh, the whole workshop is A Practical Introduction to Reproduce or Comp Computational Workflows. So I guess now we've had, we've had a nice little overview of the kind of things we're going to cover today um, and a bit of an overview of what we're going to kind of, um, the software we're going to be using. But for the rest of the time, we're going to try and be as hands-on as possible. And as, and as Peter mentioned, the three of us are here. So while any one of us is kind of presenting some of the more practical side, the other two are available like if you need any help. So as Peter was saying with the, with the cards, if you're fine, if you're fine and you're happy working along as you are, don't put either of the little two post-it notes on your laptop. And then the red one, if you need some help from anyone, or wave your hand around um, and obviously we'll come over. Um, otherwise, um, the green one, if you're kind of a bit bored and you've kind of finished off what we're saying, and maybe we can suggest some more areas for you to play around with while everyone else is catching up. It's obviously a, some people will be more experienced with certain bits than others. Um, can everyone see this, or is it helpful maybe for it to be a bit bigger? So I guess a little bit of housekeeping before we start. So this is the GitHub page for the repository that contains everything we're going to be using pretty much um, in, this, in this workshop. And so if at, if at any point you, this kind of, this, this lays the track for where we're going. So we've got kind of a schedule here loosely time-wise um, and, and so on and so forth. And then within each of these topic areas, um, we've, we've got kind of all the files that you need in order, um, in, in order to go about kind of running what we need. If you do get lost at any point, We've tried to include as much information as possible within each one of the subsections. So if you kind of get lost or you want kind of a text representation of what we're either demonstrating or showing, or more for the bits where we're kind of letting you run a bit more free, um, these, these kind of, um, within each of the repos, these readme files should hopefully help you guys out a lot um, in, order to, in order to kind of keep up and know what's going on. So the first tool we're going to cover in a little bit more detail is Conda. So as, um, as Peter, is this big enough? No, let's make this bigger. As, uh, yeah, yeah. As, as Peter mentioned, uh, Conda is both an environment management tool and a package management tool. And I guess it's qu quite, quite helpful to think of these things in two different ways. So on the package management side, if you've got a whole bunch of different um, packages that you want to install, um, unlike pip, Conda will actually work out the dependencies between the various packages and find if it's, if it's at all possible a common install that allows all, all of the packages you've specified to run and communicate nicely. On the other side, you've got the environment management tool side, which effectively means that Conda runs somewhat similar to a set of different virtual machines within your computer, but what it calls environments in order to keep these packages separately. So if you have one set of software that needs one set of requirements, you can have an environment with which to, with which to run that, say, set of Python scripts. Whereas if you've got a different, set of, a different piece of software that uses a different set of requirements that might directly conflict with that first set, or you just don't want to have too bloated an environment with, say, every package under the sun installed, you can set that up in a completely separate environment that won't communicate at all with your first environment, um, which can be quite nice and clean. So I suppose I'm looking around. I'm seeing quite a lot of Macs and then a few non-Macs. How many people are running Windows here? If you just a quick show of hands. So a few. Um, we're, doing the, we're running this on a Linux machine. If you're running this on Mac, everything will work pretty much identically. If you're running it on Windows, everything will work, but there'll be a little bit of, um, a little bit of differences with how you'll run things. So I guess Linux and Mac are both Unix-based, so you have terminal. We'll be running a lot of the commands from terminal. Um, if you're in a, on a Windows machine, the only slight distinction to make is you've had to install, I guess, both git bash and the Anaconda prompt. So the Anaconda prompt is for anything Conda related and Git Bash is for the other. So we'll try as much as possible to say which one, if you're a Windows user, you should be using at any one time. If you're on Mac or Linux, don't worry about any of that. But I just wanted to, like, I guess, bring that up. So if, if, you are, if you aren't sure, just raise your hand and kind of wave it around. So for the next kind of five or 10 minutes, we'll just do a quick kind of demonstration of, of of Conda. So um, if you're within a terminal and you've got Conda installed, um, you, can, you can do lots of things. So we're, together we're going to create, um, actually, so if everyone wants to open up a terminal and go, in the go into the directory where you've hopefully, I guess you guys have all cloned um, the repo from GitHub. So if you just want to go into that repo, you can see if I, just, if I just ls that we're in that repo and we've got all of the different, um, different session files that we need. Ooh. 
So for the, for the next five or ten minutes, we're going to be operating from within um, this from from within the from within the um, the Conda session. And so what we're going to do is we're going to work we're going to walk through how to create a new Conda environment, how to then share that environment, and maybe if someone sent you a different environment, how you might install that. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new environment. So to do that, you type Conda, which is just saying use the Conda package, then create, and we're going to create a new environment with the name my first environment. And this is going to be a very minimalistic environment. So to start with, we're only going to set it up with Python and nothing else. Um, there's other ways to set up environments that I'll show you later, but this is probably the simplest way to set up a very minimal environment. And we're going to set it up with Python, and we're going to specify that we want Python 3.7. If I hadn't specified that at all and just said Python, it, it will install Python. And what Conda does is it basically tries to install the latest version it can, but you don't always want that. So quite often, you're going to want to specify exactly what version you want. So if we press Enter, then Conda will go and will try and solve for the environment. And it might be a bit, you'll probably see more on your screen than this one, because we're quite zoomed in. Um, but all it's saying here is, um, this is the environment we're going to, this is, this is the environment, it's managed to solve it, so solving environment equals done, and then we're going to need to install a few packages to do so, and then do you want to proceed? So we just say yes, it'll download these packages, you see really here the only large one is Python along with a few basic dependencies, and then very shortly it should hopefully be done. Sure. Um, so it was um, conda create uh, dash dash name my first environment or my first env and then python equals 3.7. So this is a good example. So here we're loosely following the instructions that are within this conda, within this conda repo on the readme. So you can see we're kind of just running through this at the moment. Um, so if you do miss something like that, yeah, here is definitely here is the place to look. So we, we've this, the command we've run is this one so far. Type yes, and then it will install, it will start installing the environment for you. So it's now installed this environment. So at the moment, um, you're, you, depending on what you're using, you might have a base here, or you might just not have anything in front of it. So we're not currently in this environment. We've created this environment, we're not operating from within it. So if everyone's environment's installed, we can, quit, we can activate the environment um, as Conda suggested by typing Conda activate my first environment. And now you can see that we've got my first environment written up here, so we, so we know we're operating from within this environment. So only packages that are installed within this environment will be available to us. You can also see if you can't remember the name of your environment or you're not sure um, what is there, we can ask Conda to tell us all of the environments that exist by typing Conda env list. And so you can see we've got quite a few environments. You might not have as many. Um, but this just, this just can out, this, this can then help you remember kind of what you do and don't have installed. So, yep. Sure, sorry. So has everyone managed, has, has everyone's environments installed? If they were trying to install it, great. So we're within our environment. We're kind of pretty sure it's set up. Um, the fact that it installed successfully means kind of it is. But if we just, but if we did just want to check that Python was actually there, you can obviously start running any commands that you would want to run from within your environment. So if we just say type Python, you can see that Python is now launched, and we're within Python 3.7, which was what we specified. And if we wanted to execute any Python commands from within um, this Python window, we could. So one of the things we might want to do from within this is say we want to write a Python file, but we want to use a package. Say we want to write something with um, NumPy, let's say. If we very naively just assume we already had it installed, if we try and import NumPy, we'll see quite naturally we get an error message because we haven't installed this yet. So if we, um, 
Oh. If we quit out of Python, we can now install NumPy within this environment. So if you want to install something within an environment, the easiest way to go about this is if you're within the environment. So we have my first environment activated. You then type conda install and then the name of the package you want. Occasionally you might have to specify the channel. So conda hosts some packages itself. Um, other packages are hosted by other providers, but you can still install with Conda. And so sometimes you have to specify the channel. Um, I would say here Google is your friend if you want to install, if you know there's a package you want to install, just searching how do I, like, package name install Conda, it normally gives you the instructions. For NumPy, that's distributed within Conda. So if we go Conda install NumPy, and then let's specify the exact version that we want, which here is going to be one. 0.16.4, and then press enter. What Conda will then do is it'll look at our environment and work out, is this request that we've asked for possible to install within our environment? And if so, what changes does it need to make? It handles all of that. And if this kind of pops up as it has, um, if, if it gives you the option to proceed, basically it means it's found a way of solving the requirements. So if we just say yes within that, this will then install NumPy within this environment. So we'll not only just have Python, but we'll have NumPy that I guess is a, is a very common package that you're probably all familiar with for linear algebra. Um, and then we'll have a new environment with that. Unfortunately, it looks like it wants to download it all. Um, I thought this would be locally cached, so I hoped it run, would run a bit quicker than this, but it looks like it's not. Um, Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we, we may or may not end up skipping this sec skip, skipping this install somewhat because it's somewhat incidental um, if this if this takes a long time. So the question is, yeah, is this just Python or can use it for other things like R? So, yep. Um, Conda is written in Python, but can be used um, with, with a variety of languages, um, such as, yeah, R, R Ruby, and other, and other ones. It, there's lots of languages that distribute um, packages within Conda. I'd say Python is by far the most popular, and almost all mainstream packages that you might want to install, you can install with Conda. Um, that's a good point, though. If, if, you, if there is a package, say, that you can't install within Conda, you can install pip within Conda, which sounds a bit perverse. But if for whatever reason you can't and you need to be a bit more manual and hacky, you can. But yeah, other languages are definitely provided for. Um, and that's true of Jupyter as well. Um, so when we get onto the Jupyter stuff, we're going to be demonstrating it with Python. Um, but R is also very popular within Jupyter. And I think there's, there's over 100 different Jupyter kernels, i.e., there's over 100 different Pro, um, specific programming languages that you can run from within Jupyter. Was there another question? Um, yeah, so um, the question was about source activate versus conda activate. Um, I guess historically um, there were two different commands. I don't really know why there was that distinction. Um, in the latest versions of Jupyter, I think they've actually got rid of all of the source activate type commands. And so in the latest version, it's just conda activate. I don't know, Fergus, if you want know the difference so, a bit more. So
So the question was about, I guess, if you if you have an environment, how might you see what's in that environment or list things that are in it? Um, we can do that now. I'm going to leave this running in the background um, and open up a new, a new terminal window. Um, let's make this a little bit bigger. Oh, is that is that about the same size? So I'm just just navigating into the directory we're working before, so we're in the same place. So yeah, you can you can list the packages within, um, you can list all the packages within an environment. So if we look, if we look at the environment that we've just looked at, so if we type conda env export, there's multiple ways of doing it. Sorry. So if we actually activate an environment, so if we conda activate my first environment. You can see now that we're in it as we were before. And if you type conda env export, it lists all of the all of the all of the packages within an, in an environment. And this can be really helpful, I guess, to follow on from this question. Um, if you then want to share that environment with someone else. So if you run if you run the same, effectively the same command, so you don't actually have to be within the environment. If you're not within the environment, you've got the same starting bit, conda env export, which is just conda t telling conda to export an environment. You can specify with the name which environment you want to export. So if we want to export my first environment, and then you can pipe that into a, um, into a basically kind of an install file that say let's call my first environment dot yml so the yml extension um, it's kind of almost incidental it's just i guess the the, the type of the type of file that you would normally install, uh, export it to uh, uh, sorry so if we have a look at what we've just exported um, th this is effectively then a build recipe for somebody else to use to recreate that environment. And you can see it comes with the name. Um, this channels is just, as I was mentioning before, the locations for where to, where to tell Conda to look for the packages you want to install. So here you can see we've not installed anything um, particularly exotic or interesting. So it's just saying, look in the default places. Um, and then it lists all of the dependencies and all of the specific packages that we would need to install in order to com completely recreate um, this this working environment, and if we wanted to actually do that, um, so you can actually take this file and tell Conda to make an environment from this. Um, so if we type so similar to before, we're going to start with Conda environment create, but then we're going to specify a file so we can do dash f to specify a file. And we're going to specify that file that we've just created, so my first env dot yml, and we're going to name our environment, say, copy first environment. So this will use that build recipe that we've just exported um, by listing all the packages in order to recreate basically the, the same environment. Um, I'm not actually going, oh, no, the transaction's done, so I will run this. So I was just checking to make sure that actually the, in, the NumPy install had finished that we'd done before. Um, so now you can see um, with the last command we ran this conda env create that we used the YML file to create from, it solved solve, solve the environment and, copy, and made it so we can conda de deactivate our current environment and then we can conda activate the copy of our environment, and you can see, and you can see that now that environment existed. And if I do, um, if I do the command we used before in order to list all of the different packages within the environment, I can see that, basic, that I can see that all of the packages that I would expect to be installed um, are installed. Any other questions? Ah, sorry. Um, the two windows, the first, this, this other window was just because we were installing NumPy and it was taking quite a long time. 
So I opened up a new window. Um, and in this window, we were just, um, the, so the last thing we did was to, was to recreate the environment that we had just created. Yes. Sorry, I'll try, I'll try my best not to do that because I know that gets very, very confusing. So you shouldn't need to do that. Uh, so this was just about, um, in, in this particular install, um, it seemed like you needed to continually re-export the path um, to Miniconda. So you should be able just to add that permanently, I guess, to your, you're on a Unix system to your, I guess, Bash RC. It should, if you install the latest versions of Conda, it should do all of that automatically, so you don't need to redo that. That's weird. I mean, maybe we can debug that a bit later when, um, during the break, but it, shouldn't, it definitely shouldn't do that. It should be able to just be there the whole time. Were there any other, yep. Yeah. Um, so this question was about does Conda continually re-download packages and install them in different environments? Yeah, like so um, what Conda does is when you install a new package, it down if you don't if it's a new package that you've never installed before, it will download that package and install it in the environment you've told it to install in. If you then it then what it does is it caches the download for that package. Um, so that if you wanted to reinstall that in a new environment, um, as we saw when we just created this copy environment, it installed really, really quickly because it didn't need to download any new packages, but it did reinstall those packages that it had already downloaded in a new environment. So if you have lots and lots of environments that have very, very similar packages, there is a storage impact on your computer. You will be duplicating space. Um, and, and I guess you, you can, if you removed the cached downloads, you would, it would then have to re-download everything again. Um, but it's kind of an in-between between not reusing things and, I guess, still wanting to maintain very distinct separate environments. Um, so it does install them separately. Cool, so if there are no more questions um, on Conda for now, um, we're gonna move maybe towards using Jupyter. Um, a little bit more, if that works for everyone. Great, so, if I clear this quickly. So we're going to deactivate this environment, and then let's activate the, in the environment that we've installed for this workshop. So if we type conda activate ISMB, 2019. If you've, pre if you've already installed this environment, ooh, uh, it might be lowercase. Thanks, Peter. Great. So what we're now going to, so now if you've activated that environment, we're going to run the command Jupyter Lab. So depending on your how you've installed um, Jupyter, you might be able to run Jupyter Lab from within your base environment, um, or you might have to, if you've only installed Jupyter within the environment you're working in, you might have to run it from within that environment, but you should still have access to other kernels from your other environments. So if we run that Jupyter Lab command, it will then fire up Jupyter Lab, and Jupyter Lab, as Peter mentioned earlier, is very similar to Jupyter. So it's a brow it's a web browser-based interactive environment for using Jupyter notebooks. And with Jupyter Lab, it has some additional functionality that lets you use um, some other things. Let me just make that a bit bigger. So you can see when I've when I've launched Jupyter Lab, the, um, so you don't need, so it's, it's web browser based, but you don't actually need an internet connection. Obviously, to use this, it's using just a local port, but it's rendering using a web browser. If it's opened in a web browser that's not your web browser of choice, or for some reason um, you end up 
shutting down the particular tab that you're interested in. So all I've done there is I've just closed the tab. You can manually navigate to the, to the port where Jupyter's running. So in this case, the default port is 8888. You might not be able to see this that clearly on here. I apologize. Um, that instruction is within the Jupyter section within our repo. And if shutting down the tab doesn't shut down Jupyter, Jupyter's still running in the background, but so re-navigating to this, to this address will relaunch Jupyter Lab. We're just going to, I'm just going to relaunch Jupyter Lab. Actually, this is, this is probably quite a good point. So I've launched Jupyter Lab, and you can see on this little file browser at the moment, um, wherever you launch Jupyter Lab from, it launches from within whichever location you launched it from. So I'd launched it from within the Conda-2 um, repository within, within our repo. And actually, I want to be one level higher. So if we shut down that tab, on here, oh. and if I go to where we launched Jupyter from, the way to shut Jupyter down is to press Control C, and then it says, do you want to shut this down? And you just say yes. So if I just navigate one, level, one layer higher, and then run the Jupyter Lab command again, that'll relaunch Jupyter Lab, but now, now when I go to my file window, you can see that we're actually within one level up within our file window, which is helpful. So if you wanted to launch a new notebook from scratch, you, on the right-hand side, you've got the list of all of, your, of all of our Jupyter, sorry, all of our Condor environments on the right-hand side. And you can select whichever one you want to work within. Um, so to start with, to illustrate, I'm going to navigate to within the Jupyter window on the file browser. And so using this, you can relaunch existing notebooks or, or other file types. So to start with, I'm just gonna um, I'm gonna launch the Jupyter dash intro notebook. So if I if I double click on that, you will have you can see this the, this Jupyter intro tab popped up. So let me just close down the launcher, and you'll see this Jupyter notebook that we've already written at least part of is gonna pop up. And so one of the really nice things about Jupyter notebooks is you can integrate both markdown um, texts, which renders nicely, which you can include bullet points, text explanations, um, alongside actual code within a cell-based environment. So if you wanted to, say, edit some of these instructions, if I double click on it, you get the markdown text that was used to produce this, and you can type whatever you want. Um, and then you can re-execute cells by pressing Shift and Enter. So shift enter is going to be your best friend while we're using Jupyter, for those of you who haven't used it before. And then if you just, if someone shared with you this notebook, you could just kind of look through it. But we're, what we're going to do actually in this, um, for the next few minutes, is we're going to actually work through this notebook. So how does Jupyter work with Conda? You can see in the top right-hand corner here, it will specify which Conda environment you're working within, and so therefore which set of packages you have access to. And you can change this really easily. If we click on, if we just click where it said Python 3, it will then, then prompt us to select kernel. And so you can select from all of your different kernels, um, which, could be, which could be Conda environments, but could be a different programming language altogether. It could be R or Yulia, say. And you can select from all of the preferred kernels which one you'd want. So we're going to be working from within the ISMB 2019 kernel. So we've selected that, and we press select. And you can see up in the top right-hand corner, it's now changed to tell us that we're working from within a Python kernel, and specifically the Conda environment ISMB 2019. So now what we can do is we can start we can start running through the cells and actually re-executing everything in this notebook. So if we start, so as I said, shift enter is your friend. If we just go into the first cell and press shift enter, 
you can see momentarily this, what it's where it now says one, change to a star, and the star means that cell is either executing right now or is queued up in order to execute. And in this cell, all we've done is we've in, imported several packages that we're gonna use later in our notebook. Um, in text form, we've explained what these packages are, and now within, within this notebook, those packages are active. One of, the nice, one of the really nice things about Jupyter Notebooks, and one of the main ways I actually use it, um, is, is in order to make figures. And so you can make a figure, it, it will pop up after the cell, and you can continually change and edit figures without having to, say, rerun a whole Python script. And actually, you only need to rerun each cell, and all other cells in your notebook that you've ever executed before are assumed um, to still be active and have kind of been executed, and so the output of those um, you have access to. Um, so in order to, in order to help, um, in order to actually display images in line, quite often with, with matplotlib, you need to run this matplotlib inline command. I would say don't worry too much about this, just frequently you'll probably come across it in notebooks or need to include it yourself. So in the rest of this notebook, um, we're just gonna really simply analyze a very, very basic data set. Um, and just to show, I guess, some of what Jupyter Lab can be used for in the kind of the most simplest use case. So the data we're going to be looking at is stored within data.csv that we can see on the left-hand side. This is actually a very small data set, so we can actually just look at that CSV file directly. And one of the nice things about uh, the Jupyter Lab GUI interface versus, say, um, Jupyter Notebooks that several of you mentioned you'd used before um, is that we can look at more than just notebook files within Jupyter Lab. So if we double click on data.csv, actually um, Jupyter Lab will render very nicely this CSV data file so we can see all of, all of the data that we're looking at. So, very, so if it's a very small file like this, we can see we're looking at a data file that has various heights, weights, ages, and eyes, eye colors for, for a set of data points. And so here our data set is only 20, 20 data points long, so it's very easy for us to visualize here, but you can imagine maybe doing this with a larger data set. In addition, if you have any Python files, if we double click on utils.py, which is a Python file that's gonna be, uh, that we might find helpful for this example, that also loads, and you can make changes within that Python file and save it all within Jupyter Lab, and we'll see, we'll, we'll use that later. So if we just shut those two down, and now we're back in our notebook, the first thing we're gonna do is load this data file. So we go into the, we go into the cell where that's defined, and we press Shift Enter, and so now we have loaded um, the data file. Just to check we have, you can, you can, we've loaded this with pandas as a, as a data frame, so what we can actually do within lab is display the first few rows of that, of that data table. So again, if we just shift enter our way through this, you can see immediately the data is loaded. And you can see it's, it's the same format as we had before within, within the CSV file, where we've got the various heights, weights, ages, and eye colors that we were interested in. So I guess we're gonna, we're gonna now create some figures with that, uh, with, with that data using Seaborn. Um, if you haven't used Seaborn before, it's kind of like an, imp an improved version of, of matplotlib that has some different ways of plotting stuff, but it interacts nicely with pandas data frames. Um, I guess if you can read up on Seaborn if you're more interested, we're just gonna use it here um, to, plot, to plot a few things. So if we, if we just shift enter on this, it produces the plot we've defined. If we say don't like anything we've done, we could change that from say eye, eye color to say, I oh, know we want to spell color differently. We just change that. We pressed shift enter again. Oh no, that's actually the name of the thing. Sorry, let's not do that. Say, say the figure's not big enough. Say we can't see it. We can change the size of the figure from five by five to eight by eight, for example, and re-execute, and you can see now the figure has just reproduced itself, but with a slightly different size. 
There are, there are numerous different plots we could plot in order to help visualize our data. And again, this is something that I find really helpful to do within Jupyter. So the next plot is, is going to be a, is a violin plot that looks to see if there's any, if there's any relationship between height and eye color. So if we press shift enter on that, you can see that it, it again reproduces this we've had. And it, and it appears just from looking at this data very briefly that if you have brown eyes, the heights are very, are very clustered, whereas maybe for some of the other eye colors, there's a greater range of heights. This is obviously completely an artificial data set. Um, so there's no meaning here, but you can see how if you had a more real life data set, it'd be very easy to just create, create several exploratory plots of your data and explore explore around, make some changes in a very quick, in a quick manner, but in a way that you could then come back and run it all again later. Now at the start, we imported, um, we imported some kind of pre-installed packages. Within JupyterLab, you can, you can also import code from Python files as you would do naturally within, say, a normal Python script. So what we might want to do is import this, the utils.py file that we have on the left-hand side that I showed slightly earlier. And you would do that the exact same way you would do within a regular Python file, just typing import utils. So if we shift enter that cell, it's, we now have all of the functionality from within utils. And if we make a new cell, we can actually see that. So one of the nice things is autocomplete. So if we type utils dot and then press tab, the, the, there's only one function within the utils file, but you have this nice autocomplete. So, so you can use it like you might use other, um, I guess, um, Py, Python interfaces, things like Py, if you're used to using PyCharm or other things like that that help with autocompletes, um, JupyterLab has that built in nicely. And so if you're within, if you're not sure of, say, what a function name is or a variable that you've defined, if you just hit tab um, a couple of times, then it will pop up with, with kind of possible autocomplete options. And so this also, you can also use this to check whether or not you've actually imported the package you think you have imported. Because if we hadn't successfully imported utils, it wouldn't come up with this make dummy data set function. Um, if you didn't want to import utils um, as, an entire, as an entire package, you can also run the contents of Python files within cells um, using, I guess, a bit of inline magic that if you're familiar with um, IPython, with IPython, which predated Jupyter, you'll be familiar with. And Effectively, this command um, percentage sign run just runs the Python file within this, almost like if you'd run it from a command line. So as utils, it doesn't do anything as a Python file. It just specifies some functions. Those functions are now available to you without the kind of utils prefix. You can also, within, within JupyterLab, um, access doc strings. Um, so if you have a function that has some nice documentation, you can look up the function. So within, within the utils import that, we've just, that we have just imported, we have our make dummy data set function. If you then type a question mark after it and press shift enter, it will render whatever the, uh, the doc string that explains what the function does, what imports it takes within the cell. As I mentioned before, if you wanted to make changes within a Python file that you've maybe already got, you could double click on utils, make some changes within this Python file, save it, and then, and then re-import it, and then you've got those changes. But you can also use some other inline magic to load the Python file within a cell. So if you type percentage side load, and then the name of the Python file, it just loads that whole, the whole set, the whole file within the cell, and then you can make any changes you want here, and then you can either run that cell within JupyterLab, running it locally, or you can write that file out again. So if, say, we change, um, we change our function slightly, so you can see the data set we used for this file I actually created with this function. Um, so it's a completely artificial data set. Um, so maybe I change um, the height distribution, um, which, yeah. Maybe I change the height so that they're not, 
the average height is not 1 meter 70 with a standard deviation of 0.1, but is now, um, let's say, 1 meter 60 with a standard deviation of 0.2. I can press Shift Enter, and that is overwritten the make dummy data set function not within the utils file, but within, our lo within this local notebook. Alternatively, if you want to overwrite the utils.py file and update the data within there, you can type two percentage signs, write file, followed by utils.py, which is the location you want to write it to, press shift enter, and it will overwrite the f that file with our new function. And we can very quickly check this by opening up utils.py. You can see that now, instead of the 1 meter 70, it's now the 1 meter 60, as, we, as we've just changed it to. So we can actually make a new data set with that change and see and then visualize those results. So in this cell, we're, we're making a new data set. So it's not called all data now, but all data underscore new. So I've made a new data set, and I can actually plot both, both of those two data sets and compare to see if there are any differences. And there aren't for some reason, and I'm not, we probably don't have any time to debug that now. I'm not quite sure why that hasn't worked, but hopefully so far you've got a flavor of some of the very basic things you can do within JupyterLab, and now that you've kind of shift entered and played your way through, a little bit more familiar with the environment and the interface and some of the things it might be used for. I guess now we want to give you a couple of minutes um, if you want to play around with this yourselves or make any changes to the notebook and just see how it works, re-execute things, um, but also take any questions you might have on JupyterLab um, before Peter's going to demonstrate um, maybe some other nice functionalities that are more relevant for the computational biology field. So the question was, do you need to choose unique names for variables? Yeah. So, 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 it, so I guess you should think of these notebooks as, I guess, different from a regular Python file. But in a lot of cases, they're effectively exactly the same. So maybe we just do a very quick example down the bottom to demonstrate that fact. Let's say we define the variable a to equal 7. We shift enter, so now we have this new variable a that equals seven. So if we just want, if we just print a, so we're printing the value of a, we can see it's seven. If we now change a to equal eight, and go back and re-execute the cell that where we printed a was seven, it will now tell us that a is eight. So you've just, by running a new cell, we've overwritten the value of a. Um, and you can overwrite it either within the same cell or, the, or a new cell. So we can, if we run that cell again, but now we've said A is nine, it's obviously a very, very simple example. And we print A again, it's now, it's now nine. So it works the same way that in a Python script, if you had if you'd kind of overwritten something further down, it would update. The slight difficulty sometimes with Jupyter Notebooks is if you don't execute from top to bottom, if you make a change lower down and then go back and re-execute things, when you come back to it, if you just run all the cells, you might break something. So you do need to be somewhat careful when you're using notebooks, and this is a really great point, that you try and keep things as sequential as possible from top to bottom, but while having this greater functionality to be able to do some of this stuff, it's definitely something to be mindful of. Exactly. So, so the question was, what if you want to reset everything and run everything from top? So if you go up to this, um, kernel win window on the file browser at the top of it, you can so interrupt the kernel. So if you have, if you execute a cell and it's taking forever to run, say, say you're meant to loop over, say, 1 to 10 and you ex accidentally looped over 1 to 1,000, you can interrupt the kernel, which should kill the current cell, but still keep everything, all your other variables or your other imports alive um, without, without wiping everything. If you want to kind of restart all from scratch, you use one of the restart commands. 
So you restart your kernel, which wipes, which wipes everything you've imported, all the variables you've set up, and lets you start again. And so there's three different ways you can do that. You can just restart the kernel, and it will leave all the outputs that we've got. So obviously, um, we have a bunch of outputs. If you press restart kernel, they will still appear there. If you press restart kernel and run all cells, what it'll do is it'll restart the kernel and we'll just execute the notebook as you might execute a regular Python file, which can be useful when you've finished a piece of work just to check everything works okay. Or alternatively, you can clear the output. So say we don't want those charts to be displayed anymore. If we click restart kernel and clear all outputs, it gives you this warning telling you, as you pointed out, that you'll lose all your variables. And so you can see now all the, all the outputs we've have gone. Um, so the easiest way to run all cells is to say is to do that. And now this will just, starting from the top, execute all of the cells. And you can check the order the cells have been executed in, because next to the cell there'll be this little number. So here you can see one, and that means that when the notebook was launched, that was the first cell that was run. And then the two. So we've run this sequentially, so there'll be an order. And you can see that it's now just remade all of the, all of the figures and all of the, all of the other things we've created. Um, and you can see what order it's run it in. If there are no other questions, maybe Peter, do you want to go through the, uh, the uh, another notebook? I'll just leave it. I'll leave it like that. So in, in Jupyter Lab, open up the next notebook, the one called 3D Visualization. So this is a biology example. Let's see. Let anybody, everybody there or having problems getting there? Okay. Well, we'll see if your installation. You see this error message down here. Don't worry about that. We'll, we'll go away once we run the notebook. So this is an example. You know, you can include all kinds of biological data, there are visualization tools available. For example, you can put in a genome view if you're interested in genomes. I show an example of, of 3D structures. You know, there are a number of plugins you can use for you know, specific biological vi visualization. And the one we're using here is called Py3dmol. You see the import statement, Py3dmol here. So let's just run through this example here. Let's run it step by step. Maybe you can just follow along here. So first we do the import. Let's see if that ever works for everyone. Everybody be able to import this correctly? Okay, looks like. Okay, so next one we wanna uh, look at a protein from the protein data bank with, with this ID, 5WOG. The nice thing about Jupyter Notebooks, and this is what you should do, you can put links in there. So if you click on, on this link, you go to the protein data bank, and you see you know, that's the structure we wanna visualize in here. Okay, so let's continue on. So the first step, we instantiate the view with this particular PDB ID, so let's do this. So and you will see, it visualizes the structure here. Did everybody get to this point? Okay. I mean, this is not very interesting. It's probably not very useful. We probably want to apply some different styles to it. So I'm just going to show you a little quick review how, how you can visualize 3D structures. So and then we're going to the next step here. You know, proteins are made out of protein chains. We may want to, you know, style each chain in a different color or different style. So that's the first one here. So let's run this. Are we applying a style? This particular protein has multiple chains, and one of the chains is called the chain A, and we want to render it as a cartoon in, in an orange color, so that's what the style command does. So if we go down here now, you see there's now one chain in here that's now colored in, you know, in orange. So, and you know, there are more chains, so we want to color all the chains, and we can do that too. So here's just an example how you would do that. So, for example, we set the style for chain A and B, we're making it a list, and we color that in orange. And those are, this is what we're showing is actually hemoglobin. It has four chains. It has two alpha chains. So the first two, A and B, those are the alpha chains. That's why we add a label here, alpha subunits in this particular color here. And then there are two other chains called C and B, and we're going to render them in blue. This is the beta subunits, and we add again a label here. And when we run this cell, OK. 
Yeah. So here you see the you know, the color applied, and we also see the labels here. You know, that's a nice thing about Jupyter Notebook. You know, you you can really ready make this. You know, you really want to make it interactive, so you can attach labels and and, and so forth. You know. No, I think this is reproducible. Obviously, you can use a tool like PyMol or whatever your favorite 3D viewer is, or JMol, whatever you have. But every time you do it, you need to do it over and over again. Here you can set it up once and run it through, you know, a hundred protein structure, and every, everything looks the same. So you can set it up in advance. Okay, and we go to the next step. Now we want to let's see what we're doing next. So next, we're going to show a residue name here. So in here, it says set the style with a residue name heme. This is hemoglobin, so it has a molecule bound in it, which is called heme. And this is shown now in green spheres here. It says, OK, for heme, use spheres. And the color scheme is called green carbon here. So that's what we applied right, right here. And then. Okay, sometimes you may want to highlight a binding site. You know, you have a small molecule that binds to a protein, you want to highlight them. So that's shown in, in this next example where we say, okay, show me all residues highlighted within five angstroms of, of, a, of a heme molecule, and that is this one here. Let's see. So here is an example, here's one heme, and you see all, all the residues around it. As you probably know, if you're familiar with heme, in the center in orange, this is an iron atom here. And you see it's interacting with the histidine, this is the histidine side chain here. So that's an example you know, of, of a customized kind of uh, representation. And then finally, people like to add surfaces to protein, so that's the last example. This is an HLA complex. It has a heavy and a light chain and an antigen peptide to it, so we're creating a, a custom representation for this here. So here in, in yellow, that is the light chain. In blue, as shown as a ribbon diagram and a transparent surface, that's the heavy chain. And then if you turn this thing around, you will see there's an antigen peptide bound to it, which, which we highlight here as, as orange spheres. And again, if you go up here, you see an example how you would do that. OK, first we need to define what's the heavy chain. That's in this case A. The light chain is B, and the antigen is C. Those are the three chains in this protein. We set the style for each of them. The heavy chain is cartoon. The light chain is cartoon to a different color. And the antigen we render as a sphere. And finally, we add a molecular surface, a solvent accessible surface to, to this to the heavy chain only. So this is an example of the kind of things you can do. And finally, you want to create that image that you want to put in your publication. You can do that too. And we go one step further. It says viewer.png. So this will create a PNG image of that. So first you rotate this thing in the way you want it. Then you run viewer.png. And you get a static image right here. And to copy that, that depends on your operating system. So if you're on, on Windows, you do a shift, right click, and then you can save the image. If you're on a Mac, you do, since you don't right click on a Mac, you do shift, control, click. And you can do that, let's see. And I'm not used to this computer here, so I'm not Sure. OK, let's see. Yes, yeah, so on, on this computer, I did a shift right click, and you see this menu, browser menu comes up, and you can say copy image, save image as. So that's the way you do it. So the only thing to remember is you cannot just do a control copy. You need to do this thing with shift, shift right click, or shift control. That's the little thing people miss. So that's the way you can create an image. 
So this is supposed to be just an example, you know, in, in a Jupyter notebook, the idea is you want to do things visually, you know, you don't just want to run code. So whenever possible, do some Googling. I'm sure there are some plugins around for your type of research you're doing, if it's sequences or, or 3D structures or genome sequences. I'm sure there are some viewers out there that you can plug in like this one here. So any questions? Okay. All right, so I guess the next thing up we'll do Git and GitHub. Yes. You mean uh, how we deal with with? Yeah, we we can deal with that. We'll, we'll talk about that later when we define the environment. So when I talk about the binder session, we talk about how we define it. We already shown you how you create an environment where you say, okay, I want to use Python 3.7, right? So that's the way you define that as well as any software. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. I'm not sure. Can you try to rephrase your question? Uh, so, I'm a data on a, on a server? Yes. So Yeah, I mean, you could start your browser on, on your server side if that's possible. You know, I mean, you really want the data at the same place. Or, or if you have data available through HTTPS or so, you can put it in a URL to get your data too. You know, so if your data file is on some website or your server and you can get it through a URL, then you can use that URL in your notebook. That way you can get to remote data sets. Yeah, any other question? Yes. Yeah, yeah, de definitely. So with this viewer, you can do basically anything. It's only up to your creativity. And maybe later in the session at the end, you know, we have a one-hour session where we can work on our own project. I can show you an example of looking at protein-protein interactions. So we have examples like that. Yeah. For example, you know, in this case, I said, okay, let's find all residues within five angstroms around this heme molecule. We could also say, Here's a protein chain, find any other residues in another protein chain within five angstrom. That would define that protein protein interface, for example. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I guess then we'll continue on with Git and GitHub. Before I start anything, you have a question. How do you, from the 3D visualization? Uh, Peter, I think that's a, this is definitely a question for you.
Um, just last calls on questions. No. No. Okay, cool. So uh, this is an interesting order in which to do things, um, given that you've already cloned stuff off of GitHub and I've already helped several of you with uh, Git-related issues. Um, I'm just going to very briefly talk about um, the idea of version control and remote source code hosting more generally before giving a very quick practical demonstration of how you would go about using Git to set up version control locally on your code um, and just how, how, to, how to manipulate that, how to manage that, and then how to, given that you already have a local project, how to then go and create a repository for that on a code hosting platform such as GitHub and how to link your local repository to that remote repository and how to uh, transfer changes between the remote and the local repository and how to share that with people and how to make copies of other people's projects. Um, so several of you we've already jumped the gun with when I downloaded stuff for you. Um, and so I'm aware that I think about half of you have already used Git and or GitHub in varying capacities. So if you've already worked with Git before, then please feel free to uh, jump ahead, maybe go, go on the repository for the workshop, make a fork of it, and you know, change something you want to change. Um, you know, make my slides better. Okay, so I suppose the key question we want to actually answer here, what is, what is version control? And just as importantly, what isn't version control? And why do we want to use it? So I'm sure all of us at some point, I'm certainly guilty of this, have, when working on a project, um, created several revisions to that project, say it was your undergraduate lab report or your master's thesis or your doctoral thesis, where you had a version of it and everything looked fine and you gave it to your supervisor or your boss or you read it yourself the following morning and you tore it to pieces because it was horrible. So you went in and you made a bunch of changes to it and then you decided, okay, I want to keep my original copy. So you saved a new version of the file called uh, Project 1.1 and so you revised it and you updated the file and then you handed it to your supervisor and it came back with slightly less red ink but it still made you very sad. So you went in, you made all the changes, and you went to save your updated version. But you don't want to overwrite the ones you've already made, so you save yet another version called uh, report version 1.2. And this iterative process went on and on and on, and before you know it, you have an entire directory on your computer full of files that say report version 1, 1.1, 1.2, blah, 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 2.1, da, 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 report final draft, report really final draft, report for the love of God, print this thing now, report it's late, I just failed my defil. Don't do that. Um, but knowingly or unknowingly, what you've essentially done there is a very primitive version of version control. Um, so the idea behind version control is you want a system that will automate the process of keeping track of different versions of a project um, and more importantly, tracking the differences between versions of a project. Um, so the very naive thing to do is you, on your local machine, you have multiple different copies of the project, and you could, in principle, use your favorite text processor to compute the difference between the two files. But that gets clunky, that's very slow, it requires that you have the full copy of every version of the file, so it uses up a lot of storage, and it's incredibly prone to human error. Um, we've all RM, RF'd something we shouldn't have at some point in our lives. Okay, maybe just me. Um, but the idea behind using version control software is you want to automate this process while having a minimal overhead possible, while also enabling you to revert cha any particular changes that you don't like at any one point in time. Um, so there are lots of different version control systems, and we'll get into... I'm not going to list off a bunch of names of version control systems, because that's not particularly useful, but I'm going to touch on the different forms of version control. Um, but what all version control systems have in common is that they're automated systems for tracking differences between files, um, usually in practice used for source code files, but in principle there is nothing stopping you keeping your enormous data set under version control. I, I do that for some data sets. Um, I think something that's important to stress um, that I do occasionally see uh, conflated with version control is that a version control system is not a backup system. 
Um, now, you can use a version control system together with a backup system to manage your code and to roll back a code base if something catastrophic happens to your computer. Um, but a version control system such as Git will not create a backup of your data. So if your laptop dies and all you had was local version control, you're screwed. Um, so, so don't expect it to back up your code because it won't. Um, so there are th three different paradigms for version control that I just want to briefly outline um, before jumping into how Git works and what we're going to do with it. So the simplest case of version control is where you have what's known as a local version control system, where, as illustrated in this figure that I uh, shamelessly pilfered from the Git documentation, um, you have some data. You have some database of, for example, a, a the code base for software on a single local computer, and within that database you have version information for different versions of the project. So you have the current state of the project, and then you have the changes that were made to get there from the previous version, and so on and so forth all the way back. So in principle, you can regenerate the previous versions by just reversing those changes. Um, and, and this all lives locally on your system. And a user on your local computer using your version control system can check out a copy of a file from a particular version to work on, make some changes, and then commit those changes to the local version control database. Um, and so th these are sort of the early, bef before we sort of descended into the world of everything is on the cloud man, um, some of the earliest forms of version control were relatively simple, um, by today's standards, primitive local version control systems. Um, but all version control systems today build on these same principles of you have a database of files. As a user, you check out a particular version of a particular file, make some changes, check it back in, and you can at any point revert those changes. Um, the next level of this is where you ha want multiple different users on multiple different machines to have access to the project. Um, and obviously, it's, it's not a good idea for us to just all work on one computer, because bad things will happen. Um, so a centralized version control system is where you will have some central server upon, on which you have the, your, your code base for your, for your software, for example. And you have the version control system set up on that central server managing the versioning database on that central server. And then each individual user connects from their computer, checks out a file from the central server to their computer, makes their changes, and then commits those changes back to the central server. Um, now this enables people to collaborate, but this is still actually a relatively primitive way of doing it because when, if you have a centralized version control system, when a user checks something out, all they check out is the file. They, they don't get all the revision history, they don't get the full version control history of the project, and so if the user realizes, ah, I could fix this bug by reverting this change, they can't do it. Um, so these sorts of systems are also quite limited. Um, and equally, there's only one copy of the version control, so if the central server dies for whatever reason, you're still screwed. Um, which brings us on to distributed version control systems. Um, and pretty much everything that you use today, um, be it Git, Mercurial, or whatever else your company is forcing upon you, will be some form of distributed version control. Um, and the idea behind a distributed version control system is that every single machine that needs access to the code base has not just a copy of the present state of the code base, but has the full version control software, they have the full version control system, they have the full versioning database, which is the current state of the code base, and all of the revision history so that any user at any point can inspect any part of the versioning history. Um, and so the advantage of doing it this way is, for one, it integrates well with uh, remote code hosting such as GitHub, which we're going to get onto in a minute. But also, one of the nice advantages of this is there's no single point of failure. So if, if everyone has a copy of the code, but only one server has the actual versioning history, if that server dies, you're screwed. If everyone has a full copy of the versioning history, then it doesn't matter how many computers die. As long as someone has a copy of the project, or as long as that project lives somewhere nebulous in the cloud, you can back everything up and get the full versioning history of the entire project from start to finish. Um, so Git is an example of a distributed version control system. Um, as you already saw earlier, um, we have the code base for this tutorial hosted on GitHub. Um, and Git 
So Git and GitHub are fundamentally two different but very, very closely related projects. So Git is an open source distributed version control system. Um, GitHub is a remote repository hosting server. And GitHub is incredibly well integrated with Git. Um, it works flawlessly as a remote server when you're, connect when you're connecting to it from Git via the command line. But it also implements some of its own functionality, specifically designed to enable users to, inter to interact with the remote server. Um, for example, those of you who've worked with GitHub before will probably be familiar with the concept of forking. Um, so Git has functionality known as cloning, which enables you to take a repository um, that, that lives anywhere, be it locally or remotely, and create a full copy of that repository, including all of the versioning history. And, and that's what all of you did earlier when you cloned the repository from GitHub. You took the state of the repository as it was on the remote server. There's nothing special about GitHub, it's just that's where we're hosting it. And you created a copy of the project. And when you did that, you didn't just create a copy of the code base as it currently stands, you also downloaded a copy of the entire versioning history. Um, so GitHub expands on this by implementing um, the functionality known as forking, which enables a user of GitHub to create a copy of a repository that's hosted on GitHub, add it to a new repository on their GitHub account, and this is all done entirely remotely. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, and so there, there are other, as, as I alluded to, there are other forms of distributed version control. Um, there are also other remote um, source code hosting services. Um, one of the most common ones that you'll often see compared to GitHub, and people can get incredibly partisan about which one they think is better, is uh, Bitbucket. Um, so GitHub's a bit special in that it is integrated with Git and specifically Git. Um, other repository ho hosting services have less Git-related functionality, but in exchange for that, can integrate with other version control systems. Um, but today we're going to focus entirely on Git and GitHub. But all of the principles that we're going to discuss today apply to just about any distributed version control system and just about any remote source code hosting service. OK? So what we are going to do, first of all, um, so in detail, as Fergus mentioned earlier, detailed instructions for everything I'm going to do today are in the readme file of the Git directory of the repository for the tutorial on GitHub. So if at any point you fall behind or you can't remember a command that I used, um, or if you want to blaze ahead, then you can always just refer back to this and that will let you know exactly what you need to be doing. Okay? So let's see, what have these people done to my poor terminal? Okay, as you see, this is an incredibly minimalistic um, part of the tutorial. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go from the basics. Um, we're going to forget about GitHub for a moment, and we're going to locally on our computers um, create a new Git repository. We're going to create some code. We're going to add that code to the Git repository, putting it under version control, and we're just going to go through how to make some changes to that code, how to track those changes under version control. Um, and then we'll just briefly go through how to set up a remote repository on GitHub and connect that remote repository to our local version. Um, if, you, if you're familiar with Git and GitHub, then do something else. Um, if you are using Windows, you'll want to use Git bash for this section, and just feel free to use Git bash for all of this. Um, I won't be using Jupyter unless we have lots of time left at the end. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is let's get out of this repository because we're going to create a new repository. So I'd recommend you navigate away from the directory for the tutorial. The reason being is when you cloned it, you got the version control history. So that directory it already has a Git repository. It's already under version control. Uh, we want to create a new repository. So I would just navigate to your home directory. Um, and if you're on Git bash, all of these commands work exactly the same as they do on Linux, so you can follow along with what I'm doing. It's not like Anaconda prompt where you have to use silly Windows commands. Um, so I'm going to create a new directory, and I'm going to be very imaginative and call it my first repo. And within my first repo, I'm going to create a readme file. 
Um, and if you're planning on hosting code on a hosting service such as GitHub or Bitbucket, it's good practice when, whenever you first create the project to create a markdown file called README. And the reason for this is as soon as you upload that project onto GitHub, if we just go back to this project on GitHub, if you have a f within any directory of the project, if you have a file called README with the markdown extension MD, GitHub will automatically render the contents of that file as markdown when you load up the page on GitHub. So it's a very quick and easy way of documenting your project at a very high level. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is create a README file for this project. Okay. All of these commands are in the markdown, so if at any point you miss anything, just feel free to go back in there. Okay, so now we're in the directory we created for our repository. It's empty apart from our readme file, which is itself empty. Um, so the first thing we want to do is actually place this under version control and create a Git repository. Yes? We in four minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm, yeah, so I think, okay, so I'll just, if we have four minutes, I will take less than four minutes. Um, so we'll finish, we'll put this, put this file, put this folder under version control, and we'll add a file to it, and then we'll stop for coffee, and then we can ask any questions, talk about everything, and if there's anything in particular, if you're completely new to GitHub, and Git, ask me what you want to see next. If you are more familiar, but there's something you're unsure about, maybe branching, for example, let me know, and we'll see what we can go through. Um, so to create a repository within a folder, we just use the git init command. Um, and so when you initialize, e even if you already have files, you could have all of the, you could have the entire so code base for your software project in that folder. When you initialize the repository, it is still empty. And what that means is none of the files in there are actually tracked by Git. None of them are under version control. None of them are actually in the repository. They're just in the file system. Um, so to add files under version control, we use the git add command. So if I type git add readme.md, what that will do is that will tell Git I want to add this file to the repository, but it won't actually commit that change to the repository. And there's a helpful command called git status that you can use to check if there are any files that you, ha that you have not yet added to the repository, if there are any files that you have ran git add on to tell it to add them, but haven't yet changed. Running git add is a process known as staging the file. So there are two steps to putting a file under version control. The first is staging the file for commit, which is telling git I want you to make these changes next time I update the repository. And the second stage um, is known as committing the changes, which is telling Git, take all those things I staged and put them under version control. And to do that, I just run the git, it would help if I could spell. I run the git commit command. Um, whenever you run a commit, you need to add a message and it's good practice to make this short, sweet and informative. And this will be in the version control history. So at any point when you go through the history, you can see all the messages and see what changes were made. Um, and is a very good reminder for stupid things that your past self did. Um, so once again, it would help if I could type. Um, again, good practice is in the initial commit, just to say this is the initial commit. So what I've now done is those stages that I changed, in this case, just adding the readme file, have now been added to the Git repository, and all of those changes are now tracked by Git and are under version control. So if I run Git status again, it'll say there is nothing left to commit. That's because all those changes have been added. If I now create a new file and run Git status again, it will warn me that there are untracked files. This means that those files haven't been added, they haven't been staged for commit, they are not under version control at all. Okay, so we're gonna stop for coffee now. God knows I need it. Uh, and when we come back, I'll just take you through a bit more making changes to your repository and how to set up remote repository hosting for that repository, how to move changes between the local and the remote repository, uh, and some other things that you might want to be aware of when you're 
specifically when you're hosting Jupyter Notebooks remotely. Um, and as I said, if anyone has any particular questions about Git, either you've never used it before or you've used it a bit, but there's something you're unsure about, just please ask us during coffee, and I'll say something about it if we have time. Okay? Let's go for coffee.